back to the lecture. Um, when the, um, the lecturer of today, Peter Burr, was asked to uh, present this uh, lecture, the Pulebeck lecture, I uh, understood that he did not hesitate one moment uh, for uh, accepting the invitation. And I think it's because of perhaps sweet memories uh, of his Mia's fellow time in 2004, 2005, that we are really very pleased that uh, Peter Burr will uh, well, present that lecture today. Um, he's a very famous historian, uh, emeritus professor in cultural history at Cambridge University. And, uh, especially the topic of today uh, about specialization, also the, the challenges and responses to the topic of specialization really fit the agenda also of the uh, NEOs where we try to promote interdisciplinarity and uh, well, with also the problems with interdisciplinarity has. So the tension between specialization and interdisciplinarity will be the topic of today as I understood and I'm looking forward to the presentation of Peter Burns. Please, perfect. Thank you very much for introducing me. It's a pleasure to be back in Amsterdam, and it's a pleasure to revisit NEOS, which I knew only in its Wassenaar phase. Um, for some years, I've been working on the history of knowledge, and so um, when this knowledge institution uh, invited me, I thought a history of knowledge might be an appropriate area to pick a talk on. But a short talk, I've been told it's supposed to be short, requires a central theme. And so I chose the history of academic specialization and of responses to it, or shall we say reactions against it. And one advantage of this choice is it undermines any simple story of progress. It, one replaces progress with a history of challenges and responses. Academic specialization was itself a response to the challenge of information anxiety, too much to know, to quote a well-known book on the subject. <clears throat> so you can say that specialization was a kind of defense mechanism. Um, but then, as so often happens in the history of ideas, or indeed history in general, or indeed maybe life in general, any solution to a problem will sooner or later prove to have generated problems of its own. So, new challenges. And in, in, then there are responses to those challenges, and as a result, still new, newer challenges, I should think, more or less ad infinitum. It's commonplace to say that the division of intellectual labor, like the division of labor in general, has been increasing, probably at an accelerating rate, since the middle of the 18th century, when uh, Diderot being one of the first people to comment on this, um, because he was interested in medicine. And medicine was a discipline where there was particularly early specialization, partly because it was so easy to divide. You either worked on a particular illness or a particular part of the body. And then, of course, um, it was welcomed by some people, including Adam Smith, who uh, not only thought the division of labor was good in a, in a pin factory, but in what he called philosophy and included, I think, uh, natural science, natural philosophy. It was welcomed by Immanuel Kant. It was welcomed by Emil Durkheim and Herbert Spencer, two sociologists who usually didn't agree about anything. But for once they um, speak in chorus, they thought specialization is a clue to progress. But then on the other side, um, I would, could take up this whole talk if I were to list the number of denunciations of specialization that have been uh, uh, printed in over the centuries. Now, the history of specialization, there's no good general book on it, I suppose, because um, it would take a non-specialist to write it. Um, <laughs> it's too big a subject for a talk like this. And so um, all I'll do is, is give two examples and move on. Take the case of encyclopedias. In the year 1630, it still proved possible for a single scholar to publish a 17, seven volume encyclopedia by himself. That was Johann Heinrich Alsted. 
But then, in the 18th century, the French Encyclopédie had at least 139 contributors. But by 1911, the year of the famous 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, many people think it was the best one, the number of contributors had increased to 1,507. And of course, that number, even that number, looks tiny when you think of the new, um, innumerable contributors to Wikipedia. Or take the example of the history of universities. In the Middle Ages, only four faculties, three for postgraduates and one for undergraduates, and the undergraduates studying a package of seven subjects, trivium, quadrivium. But today, universities are not so much a system of disciplines as a collection located in their own <coughs> departments and institutes, often with walls around them, <coughs> turning the campus into a kind of archipelago. Created for practical reasons, disciplines, like nations, as the polymath Norbert Ilias observed more than once, they're artificial, but they come to seem natural. They attract loyalties. They even attract a desire to defend the territory of the discipline against possible invaders. Another polymath, Donald Campbell, uh, coined the rather nice phrase, ethnocentrism of disciplines. I should say at this point, uh, despite appearances to the contrary, this is not an attack on specialization, which has led to many valuable discoveries. My target is over-specialization, and more exactly, the breakdown of communication between different kinds of specialists. I thought, when it was too late and this talk had been advertised, that uh, a better title for it would have been talking to the neighbors. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it's tempting to talk about the irresistible rise of specialization. But of course, it has been resisted and notably by members of that um, remarkable intellectual species, uh, the polymath. So, a few people reach the disciplines. They've done that in the past, and a, a small number still do. You may have seen a book entitled, The Last Man Who Knew Everything. <laughs> but curiously enough, um, this title turns out to be the title of four different books, four different last men, um, ranging in time between the 17th and the 20th century. The first last man is Atanasius Kirchhoff. I would have preferred Leibniz, but anyway, they chose that title for a book about Kirchhoff. And then the second one, I'm proud to say, is a former fellow of my college, Thomas Young, um, active around the year 1800, uh, known in Cambridge at the time as Phenomenon Young, because um, he was a medic, he did research on optics and acoustics, and he, he came second in the race to decipher hieroglyphics. Uh, Champollion, who won, was considerably more specialised. There's always a, there's a price to polymathy, as it turns out. <laughs> and then in the 19th century, there's a not so well-known professor in Philadelphia, Joseph Leidy, who spanned paleontology and botany and, and so on. And finally, though I don't think this is such a great choice, um, Enrico Fermi, who was clearly a genius in mathematics and physics, but didn't actually show, and the biography doesn't show, that he took much interest in other disciplines. But um, many polymaths would um, deny any claim to omniscience. All they want to do is to bridge a few disciplines, including the notorious two cultures of humanities and natural sciences. Some of them are criticized as charlatans, still are. Um, it, all this goes back to Descartes, who called Kirchhoff a charlatan. And as you know, this term has been in academic discourse ever since. <coughs> but others are generally respected. Among, <coughs> among recent polymaths, 
Um, I would like to mention two that I admire in particular. One is Michel de Certeau and the other Umberto Eco. Michel de Certeau, who when he became a Jesuit, took the course in philosophy and then the course in theology. That's all um, compulsory if you're going to be ordained in that order. But then he, they decided to make him a historian of the order, and so he did graduate work in history. Then he decided he would train as a psychoanalyst and went to uh, Lacan's seminar. And then he taught himself sociology and anthropology. Now, in at least three of the six disciplines, he, he made uh, original contributions. It may be uh, my ignorance, he might have made original contributions in still more. And of course, he's a leading figure in religious studies. Um, as for the late Umberto Eco, he began in medieval philosophy, writing a dissertation on the aesthetics of Thomas Aquinas. So the interest in aesthetics um, took him into um, criticism of literature, art, and music, especially extremely modern music. And that took him into the study of communication. Finally, into um, semiotics, where he became professor of that rather new subject at the University of Bologna. While he was doing this, of course, he also published five novels and had a, day, um, a weekly column in L'Espresso. Um, the, the many articles have been collected. They are delightful to read because he always wore his learning lightly. Um, and they range on topics as different as the Red Brigades and Canton Blay. <clears throat> I just want to mention one more, but this time a living polymath, because he's an example of a particular type of the species that I'd like to call a serial polymath, a nomad from one discipline to another and another. And that is uh, Jared Diamond, who began his academic life as a physiologist, became interested in ornithology, went to New Guinea to study birds and discovered the delights of anthropology and linguistics. And at some point, because miraculously, he's been working the whole of his academic life on one campus, University of California at Los Angeles. Um, he decided he preferred to be a, a historian or a geographer. And he was simply moved along the rather large campus and is you don't have to retire in the States, I believe he's still professor of geography there. Uh, in similar fashion, uh, Michael Polanyi, uh, who, um, like his brother Carl, was a polymath. Um, there are, are a few um, examples of um, rival brothers, not only um, Alexander and Wilhelm von Humboldt. So, um, Michael Polanyi, the younger brother, um, decided he would go into physical chemistry, partly, I suspect, because Carl had already gone into economics, sociology, and anthropology. But at a certain point in his career as professor at the University of Manchester, he went to see the vice chancellor and said, I don't really want to teach chemistry anymore. I think I'm really a philosopher. And the vice chancellor, again, rather as in the case of Diamond, said, oh, we'll, we'll just move you down the campus to the um, Department of Social Science with the title Professor of Philosophy. Now, a handful of individuals, however eminent, and there are more spectacular examples I could have given even from relatively recent times, it's not sufficient to offer a counterweight to specialization on its own. I think a collective movement is necessary to compensate a collective movement in direction of specialization. In the last hundred years, this movement has taken two main forms. One is a return to general education at undergraduate level. And the second, the rise of more or less formally organized interdisciplinary groups. So I'd like to say a little bit about each. At the end of the First World War, Nicholas Butler, president of Columbia University, introduced a program for general education. 
as, because he thought that was training for citizenship, and in 1918 he thought training for citizenship um, was never more necessary. In similar fashion, in the 1930s, the president of Chicago University, Robert Hutchins at the time, introduced a compulsory course which he called um, Great Books as an introduction to what he also called a common stock of fundamental ideas, which he thought every undergraduate ought to be familiar with. Uh, that is, it was a course in the classics of literature and thought from ancient Greece onwards. A more limited solution to the problem of specialization was the course in the history of Western civilization, which began at Stanford University in the 1930s. Similar courses proliferated after the Second World War, and to put it in a gentle way, as I think, training for democratic citizenship um, after 1945. Half the critics would say that this was really um, propaganda for the United States. But this solution, too, turned into a problem. The courses in what students called Western Civ were increasingly criticized for offering the history of white male Europeans as if it was the history of the world. And these courses were abandoned in response to criticism from the 1970s on. The trouble is that um, no one has come forward with a similar ambitious program to fill the gap, at least not um, over the university system in general. I don't know enough about individual universities to know whether initiatives have been taken. I would have thought <coughs> the history of the environment would be quite a good introductory course, or global history, or big history from the Big Bang onwards, which is certainly taught in schools, but I'm not sure about um, the university level outside um, places in Australia where um, Bill Christian teaches a few examples like that. And yet another series of attempts, uh, which I want to say more about, at a, attempts at a more general education the return to this at university level took place in the 60s and 70s with the foundation of a whole series of new universities. Sussex in Britain, Bielefeld in Germany, Roskiller in Denmark, Griffin in Australia. That's not the full list, but these are um, leading examples. I mentioned Sussex because I happened to join it myself very early in its history, in 1962, when they were laying the floor of some of the buildings. Um, there were no departments in Sussex at the time, but schools of, of study, <coughs> mainly geographical, European studies, English and American studies, uh, also social studies, African and Asian studies. The, the idea from the first, students would only spend 50% of their time on their major subject. They would also study what were called contextuals, which meant subjects from other disciplines which were connected to their major subject. So if you studied history in African and Asian studies, you probably were going to study, take at least one paper in anthropology. But in European studies, it would tend to be European literature and philosophy that you would be presented with. And in social studies, the historians would learn some sociology and so on. So it, it avoided rather neatly both the my, myopia of premature specialization, but also the equally premature liberty of the North American cafeteria system where you can um, take any, any course from a huge list, even if it has nothing to do with your other courses. I still think the Sussex system was a good one. Though I have to say, Sussex abandoned it in 2003 after almost 40 years because, so I was told, not because I wasn't there any longer, um, they said they couldn't get good enough students. They were forced to take students from the pool because not enough students were putting them as a first choice. Whether that was um, 
people just didn't feel they were um, able enough to take such a course, or more likely, in um, an age of pragmatism, they thought they didn't have such a good chance of getting a job if they weren't specialised. But now I want to turn to the history of interdisciplinary research. As in the case of specialization, general histories of interdisciplinarity are extremely thin on the ground, if they exist at all. I mean, I've, I've read articles, I've read a, a book which concentrates on the United States, but only for part of the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> nothing more general than that. Now, it was recently argued by an American psychologist called Scott Page. Um, he argued something which is, I think, counterintuitive. That if you have to solve a problem, if you try to solve a problem collectively, the most important factor is not the ability of the individuals working together. What's even more important is what he calls cognitive diversity. So each member of the group can pr provide something <coughs> different rather than have people who are um, taking turns to say more or less the same thing. So I, I would draw the conclusion that to maximize the diversity of knowledges and points of view, any research group needs to be both international and interdisciplinary. But actually the phrase, rather cumbrous phrase, interdisciplinary research group is too formal a uh, description for some kinds of conversation between scholars with different backgrounds. At the informal end of the spectrum, I was delighted to discover that a number of cafes have, over the centuries, offered settings for dialogues of this kind. Take the case of the Café in Leipzig, which I believe still exists. But the importance of it intellectually was around the year 1900. <coughs> at, this, at this time, it was the favorite haunt of four professors, each of them an individual with wide interests. And they enjoyed meeting once a week to talk to one another. There was Wilhelm Wundt, philosopher turned experimental psychologist. Wilhelm Ostwald, a chemist who was also very interested in philosophy and developed his own maybe rather wacky theory of energy. Karl Lamprecht, cultural historian who was fascinated by collective psychology and anthropology. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, almost all his um, colleagues uh, in the uh, German historical profession um, thought badly of him, but some gifted historians outside Germany were on his side, um, notably Jochen Hausinger, Arne Pichen, Lucien Febvre. And, and the last of the four, Friedrich Ratzel, a geographer who was interested in politics and ethnology and other things. So each of the four had something different to contribute at the weekly meetings, and each of them, I think, one could show if somebody was prepared to write a kind of biography of just four people, I think it could be shown what each of them had learned from the other three. Let me move now to what I call a semi-formal level, by which I mean clubs. Because at the level of membership, a club normally is formal, you're either in or out. But the activities of the club are not necessarily all that formal. So there are many examples, but I want to take an English one now, and that it is the Ratio Club, founded in 1949, meeting in London. It met every couple of months to drink beer, read papers, and discuss a common interest in what was becoming known as cybernetics. Members included psychologists, physiologists, mathematicians, physicists, and engineers, and most famous individual in a group of distinguished individuals was probably Alan Turing. In order to keep the proceedings informal, the club adopted a rule. 
no professors. Unfortunately, that led to the demise of the club once all its members had been promoted. <laughs> Still more formal is the research centre, as in the famous, or if you prefer, the notorious cases of centres for area studies in post-war, that is, Cold War, United States. These centres proliferated in the 50s and 60s, founded on the principle, know your enemy, <coughs> so, and funded by the government, by foundations like Ford and Rockefeller, and even on occasion by the CIA. Actually, I think it was probably the least harmful way that they, it could spend its money. But <laughs> the Russian Research Centre <coughs> at Harvard is probably the best example of this group of institutions. <clears throat> it brought together the anthropologist Clyde Tuchholm, the economic historian Alexander Gershankron, the sociologist Barrington Moore, the political scientist Merle Feinson, just to mention some of the most famous names. All the censors collected information on the area published monographs, but they were not so strong in synthesis. The polymath Herbert Simon criticised area studies because, according to him, they weren't interdisciplinary at all. I quote, they seem to aim at training disciplinary specialisation within area specialisation. Experts on the Russian economy, the Chinese government, the Indonesian family. So, Simon's solution was very different. Multidisciplinarity within the head of a, one individual, which is fine if that individual was Herbert Simon, a man of extraordinarily wide interests. May not work so well for lesser mortals. <clears throat> so that brings me finally to Institutes for Advanced Study. which there are more and more, but I want to talk about some of the earlier ones. Officially, they begin in the 1930s with the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, followed in the United States by the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Palo Alto. And they proliferated internationally ever since, as I'm sure you're all very well aware when deciding um, which one to apply to. Uh, <laughs> actually, I think the story is, goes back before, before the 1930s, to the 1920s, if not before. <clears throat> it was actually just after the First World War that another polymath, R.B. Warburg, turned his private library in Hamburg into a research institution focused on what he liked to call Kulturwissenschaft. It brought together studies of history, philosophy, literature, and art, with a, a dash of psychology and anthropology. Very interesting to look at the books which have Warburg's own booklet in them to see um, the variety of his own interests. Warburg detested what he called the guards on the frontiers between disciplines. As, a, um, as, as he came from a bank, banking family and had private means, he never needed an academic job, and therefore all these differences between disciplines didn't mean anything to his own life. But he was determined to fight specialization, and so his library was, not, was deliberately not organized by disciplines. It was organized by four overarching categories. The first orientation, that is, um, a floor of the institute was devoted to works of reference like encyclopedias and dictionaries. And then above that, image. And above that, word. And finally, at the top, history labeled action. <laughs> the library uh, 
which has been in London since 1933 when it was transferred bodily after Hitler's rise to power. Um, so it's still there in London, renamed, or maybe I should simply say repronounced the Warburg Institute, and it retains Warburg's arrangement. After all, the organization of the volumes in a library is very important. Whether you adopt the Jewish system, or the Library of Congress system, or whatever, each system has the disadvantage of making conventional divisions between disciplines appear to be natural. This has been a problem ever since the 16th century, if not before, because in the 16th, 17th centuries, libraries were often organized by the faculties of the university. So um, law in one place, medicine in another, theology in another, and then the liberal arts and so on. <coughs> So as I've frequented that library since 1964 and can testify to having been witness to all sorts of interesting interactions between scholars. In the case of Palo Alto, the encounter, or maybe I should say the collision between some of the founding members of the Institute in 1954, the biologist Ludwig von Bertalanffy, the economist and more than economist, Kenneth Balding, the physiologist, Ralph Gerard, and the mathematician, Anatole Rappaport. This collision produced a kind of chain reaction crucial for the development of general systems theory. Bertolanffy and company had not met personally at the time that they all turned up at the Institute. When they arrived, they somehow discovered that they were converging on something like general systems, but each from a different direction. No one ever planned this. Nobody ever predicted it. So what made this possible? Scott Page would say cognitive diversity, as you can see from my list. Um, they had very different areas of expertise. I'm sure that that's important. Um, it may well be essential, but it's not sufficient. The problem remains, what can be done to encourage fruitful interaction between people who come from different cultural backgrounds, who profess different disciplines, and who don't know, especially at the outset, um, beginning of their year, what they might possibly have in common. So, <clears throat> Lenin's famous question, what is to be done? Let me return for a moment to the Russian Research Center. There was a committee that inspected the center, not surprising if government money is going into a place. They want to find out how it's being used. The committee reported that there was more interdisciplinary conversation at lunch than there was in the formal seminars. So we return to the interesting question of informal sociability, the cafes, the clubs, and so on. Or indeed the conferences where the conversation in the intervals informally is often more valuable than the papers given formally. And then there are problems that architects may solve. The organization of space encourages certain kinds of interaction, as Frank Kurt, Levin, and other people working on group dynamics have been have delighted to show their colleagues. I know from experience in Cambridge that round tables do improve communication in seminars presumably because it gives everyone the sense they're on, the, on equal footing. And that means that the graduate student who might not have contributed feels emboldened to do so and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do this if he was sitting somewhere or at the end of a long table. And then offices can be arranged, and they actually were arranged at Sussex 
in my time now, so that one's neighbours, the offices on either side of one, they always came from a, dis a different discipline. I remember, um, since the walls weren't very thick, I shall never forget my colleague Robin Milner Gulland reciting Russian poetry at full volume um, while I was talking about the Renaissance. A welcoming space around the coffee machine, if possible provided with armchairs, may stimulate conversation in the necessary breaks between reading and writing. Non-academic institutions have been aware of this for some time, notably Japanese firms. They organize sessions at hotels in the countryside where a sake flows freely, hierarchy is suspended, and individuals are encouraged for once to say exactly what they think. <coughs> Oxbridge Colleges, which are among other things, many institutes for advanced study. Um, my own college has about um, 10 research fellowships occupied at any one time. They often inaugurate the academic year with a special dinner, which does help the fellows discover just what their new colleagues are really interested in. Once, if you, if you can discover this sort of thing at the beginning of the year, it does make it so much easier to um, carry on a conversation over a number of months. So just as the most productive moments in academic conferences are often in the corridors, so I think the intellectual importance of lunch and dinner at institutes for advanced study should not be forgotten. I've been a member of a number of these institutes myself, and occasionally I had the idea of compiling a comparative guide to the facilities along the lines of the magazine, which I certainly remember with pleasure and gratitude conversations with anthropologists in Berlin, uh, with art historians, with philosophers, with literary historians, people I would, might well never have met if it had not been that um, we were all selected to be in the same place at the same time for the best part of a year. And that's without thinking about historians working on a totally different period, totally different part of the world, a different problem, and so on. Uh, in Berlin, I remember a whole year of dialogue with Ian Kershaw and so somebody writing a book about the public image of Louis XIV might not have um, been able to learn something from a colleague working on Hitler, but over the months we discovered just how much in common we had. <laughs> the problem is that intellectual sociability, which is so uh, important, can't be prescribed. I vividly remember one attempt to prescribe it, which in my eyes at least was a total failure. In the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton in the 1960s, everyone in the Institute, um, that means mathematicians, physicists, classicists, art historians, they were all supposed to appear for tea. And the idea was that the humanists would talk to the scientists and vice versa. But of course, precisely because we were supposed to do it, we were reluctant to do it, and you saw the room divide into two groups, reminiscent of what a character in Ian Forster's Passage to India called bridge parties, um, in that case between the British and the Indians, and equally shown in the novel Not to Work. But what can't be prescribed may be encouraged by particular arrangements, including, I believe, the flow of certain liquids. <laughs> In the course of history, such encouragement has been provided by ecological niche in which small discussion groups flourish, leading to what used to be known, I think, in the Second World War among physicists <coughs> as brainwaves. My uh, uncle was in a research group like this, and they got um, extra money if they came up with what the um, 
uh, the boss thought was a brainwave. I believe it's now described as buzz. One bright idea stimulates another, spillovers from one problem or one discipline occur at the bar or in the corridor. Uh, in, to sum up in a single sentence, a successful institute for advanced study is a kind of speakeasy. Thank you. speakers if I'm not catching um, what they're saying. This is not um, an aggressive confrontation. It's really <laughs> a desire to answer the question that somebody asked rather than something which I thought was some, somehow like it. Well, you can approach through that wall. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you think of the evolutionary argument that disciplines or schools of thought within disciplines should stay separate for the same reason that for evolution to take place, there must be isolation between species. I have to confess that I've never properly researched this. And indeed, history is a particular institute of advanced study. Either they don't exist or they are um, official histories which don't really give you a very clear idea of what's going on. Um, I would love to know the answer to your question. I should have thought of asking it myself when I was writing the chapter that I was writing about the history of interdisciplinarity. But it's too late. <laughs> the book is in the press, and I haven't got an answer. <laughs> With regard to interdisciplinarity, right, and, and, and mutual contacts, yeah. that's one thing I yeah. think that's highly important, as you stressed all the time and gave many examples. On the other hand, there are also what I may call imposed yes. interdisciplinarities yeah. by new, mainly technological findings. Mm. For example, the MRI, mm. the magnetic resonance imaging, yes. has had tremendous effects on the study of brain and behavior. Yeah. And that's not a question, has not been a question of conversations mm. in an advanced study or contact between professors, but the effect of the technological development. Yeah. The DNA yeah. in biology is something similar, yeah. where the effects are imposed and better learned yeah. and taught very rapidly, yeah. otherwise you are dated. I mean, could you comment on this? Yeah. And very often the role of, one of the roles of polymaths is to encourage this kind of connection. It's true that Linus Pauling um, was, um, only came second in the race, um, but had people like him who could span physics, chemistry, and biology, um, that, that's a great help in, um, the, in working on problems which um, can't be limited to a particular discipline. If I had to defend interdisciplinarity in the group of its critics, I would go for two totally opposite points. One is the point about interstitiality, that some of the most interesting problems fall down in the gap between the different disciplines. But then the other way around is the problem of the reinvention of the wheel, that you, you can discover that people um, with very different backgrounds have noticed the same problem, but they give it totally different names which impedes communication. So once again, one's hoping for one of these um, strange people, the polymath, who has studied the different disciplines, and he can act as a kind of interpreter or translator, telling people that um, they should talk to one another because without knowing it, they have raised very similar issues. development today of, of the whole digital and cyber element as a 
uh, super language, if you will, that's beginning to affect ev so many, I, mean, I won't say every discipline, and what that's actually doing to the ability of thinkers and polymaths that don't necessarily take on that particular uh, area as a specialism. Is it possible as we go forward to be a polymath without having the whole digital element to it? I find uh, I'm at your same university, and as we are accepting more and more master's pro um, uh, proposals these days, they are just multidisciplinary, but so often dealing with AI, digital, cyber, whatever, and I'm struck by that, so I'd like your comment. Well, it would be nice if the 17th century dream for the universal language were finally realized in the 21st century. But from my own little corner history, um, I don't see it. Digital history is certainly um, becoming institutionalized, people are holding chairs in it. But what does digital history mean in practice? It means digitizing the sources so that you can you don't have to go to Simancus to work on King Philip II, a great help for <coughs> my friend Jeffrey Parker, who has suffers from muscular dystrophy but is still able to research, even though he finds even walking across the room a bit difficult. So there's that. And, and then and, and the question of how to manage big data. Um, well, that means that. Um, Thanks to digitization, it's possible to search um, a huge mass of data uh, more quickly than before. But these are not new methods. These are improvements in methods that we've already got. Um, I can't speak for other disciplines. I was only ever trained in one. Um, but it doesn't seem to me that then in this case, um, it is the utopia of the universal language. It's a, a number of rather convenient developments rather than a massive new breakthrough. But maybe people who work on, in other disciplines have a different story to tell and I just don't know about it. Yeah. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I am uh, intrigued although I can explain it, the fact that uh, almost all the names you mentioned were male. Um, I, I'm curious, obviously there's you know, the position of access of women to education and so on, it gives us an historical perspective, but today, do you see that there are polymaths who are also female? And if not, why do you think that is not the case? <laughs> I don't know how many minutes I have to answer this one. <laughs> so, in my um, cultural history of polymaths, which begins with Alberti and ends at the present, there are indeed very few um, female polymaths until the 20th century. There are some spectacular cases, of course. Um, in the 17th century, um, the Mexican saw Juana, um, in this country, there's Anna Maria. Um, what, um, that's it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I've always had problems pronouncing um, Dutch names. Gets a bit better in the 18th century um, with um, Emily de Chatelet and with, um, in Italy, um, um, Maria Agnesi and others. Still more in the 19th century, one thinks of. Um, Local example from uh, Oxford, um, no, sorry, not, not Oxford, but um, Mary Somerville, who's given her name to the Oxford College, but is actually Scottish. But in the mid to late 20th century, suddenly they come on stream in um, considerable numbers. I would think one of the first names I think of would be um, um, <coughs> um, Susan Sontag. Um, but um, when it comes to living polymaths, um, there are just so many, very often attracted to gender studies or feminist studies, not only because of their personal commitment, but also it's something that allows them to cross the barriers between disciplines. Julia Mitchell, whom I happen to know very well personally, 
and then uh, or however she's pronounced, I'm not too sure, uh, Julia Christopher. Um, so um, I, I, I'm <coughs> not sure about uh, Germaine Greer, maybe um, Griselda Pollock, a, a stronger case um, from the Netherlands, Mika Baal certainly. Yeah, um, and why has the situation changed? I think because of access to universities and to teaching posts in universities. Um, so many of the institutional arrangements were either <coughs> absent or the, um, the male professors just didn't think that the female candidate was you know, possible to appoint for whatever reason. Um, something sort of thing good as far as the future is concerned, except that they're not looking good for either sex for another reason, or rather for reasons I can't altogether fathom. I can't find any individuals that I really think of as serious polymaths who were born after about 1960. I've said this in a number of lectures as a deliberate provocation, and people do come to, up to me afterwards <laughs> with names. Um, one individual came up twice, Elon Musk, but I'm still not convinced. <laughs> remembering that, um, well, I didn't say this, um, but I'm defining a polymath in an academic sense. And there is a new usage, especially among the younger generation in Britain, to say that anybody with wide interests and abilities, whatever they are, sport, pop music, uh, they can be called polymaths too. But I decided um, I'm going to write um, the book that I would hope to finish in my lifetime. Um, I'm, I've got to restrict it in some ways. So if it's 500 years and it's the, the whole of the West, then I had better define polymaths in a relatively narrow academic sense. And in that sense, I do find it unhappily really difficult to think of somebody that meets the criteria that were still not so difficult to meet um, in a, pe among people born in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Thank you very much for your uh, talk. I very much appreciated your reference to Jared Diamond. Because when I was thinking about coming here today and hearing your talk, I thought, this is a person I would like to see mentioned, and I'm very happy he was mentioned. I have a question about the better title for your presentation, uh, about talking to the neighbors. Yes. And at first, this evokes for me suburbia, yes. where we meet during the barbecue. But sometimes you don't want to have the barbecue, and you hear a lot of noise. And a lot of people do not live in suburbia, they live in high-rise buildings. And the people on the upper floor can make so much fights among themselves that you hear it at the floor more down. And this is what I experience as a sociologist because it's low in the academic hierarchy. And the economics at one time, the economists were imperialists. So what do you have to say about my other image about talking to the neighbors? It's not only about not talking, it's also about busy buddies. I believe that academics will always gossip, whether they restrict themselves to one discipline or gossip about um, others. I do think that the metaphor of the neighbors works as a criticism as well as works as an incentive. And because I'm thinking of the fragmentation of disciplines which were, within living memory, my memory included, relatively coherent. I'm thinking of history. Um, I'm very happy that quite a lot of historians now take an interest in a discipline other than history. It used to be just the economic historians talking to the economists, but then some social historians began to talk to the sociologists. Um, and others to the anthropologists, and so on. But then there, there could be um, you're chatting over the fence, but you're ignoring what's going on in your own house. And I find, so the historian who knows about demography, 
finds it difficult to have a conversation with a cultural historian. Um, on the credit side, he or she can talk to the demographers. On the debit side, they, there is this loss of touch with one's own discipline. It costs one wants to give um, students in particular in the university setting a sense that history as a whole, that everything is connected. But I'm still fundamentally positive that I can be autobiographical again. This kind of lecture is an excuse, really, partly for reminiscence. When I went to Sussex, I was interested in, um, in sociology, and I was invited by the professor of sociology to teach some courses, sometimes with him, sometimes separately. I learned an enormous amount. But, and I think I, tried, I persuaded some of the students that you can't do good sociology without doing history. I was delighted to discover, of course, that Robert Elias from the 1950s onwards, if not before, had been complaining about the, what he called the retreat into the present on the part of the British sociologists that he knew at Leicester and elsewhere. Um, because fun fundamentally, so many of the problems faced by sociologists uh, are also faced by historians. So um, the, almost um, every um, favorable trend comes at a price of an unfavorable trend, but we, we have to live with this. I still think the balance is on the side of talking to the neighbors. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> the last question. Yeah, put, puts too much weight on my question, but um, I was struck by, by something you said about, along the way of how architects could contribute to solving some of the problems of interdisciplinary research. And it struck me because a month ago, here at the NIAS, we had a conference about the architecture of science and the humanities. We were discussing more how architecture also contributed to specialization and maybe over-specialization in your sense. So what's, what's your take on this? Can architecture both help and end uh, can it also cause problems in, 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 in the light of your discussion today? Thank you. Well, I go back to saying that I'm certainly not against specialization, but I am against um, isolation. And so um, I imagine that specializations will get ever more specialized. That has been the trend for centuries. Um, we can't probably do anything about it. Maybe we shouldn't even try to do anything about that, but we can concentrate the effort on, well, I put it this way, when I had um, doctoral students, um, one of the things that I would say is it's terribly important for, for you to realize how the rather limited um, problem century place that you're working on is related to the rest of history. And so for the most of the PhD, it's, it's done from the sources and it has to be narrow because you have to finish in three years. But there should be an introduction and a conclusion which are wider. So the, uh, the important thing is to be conscious of how the little bit that you specialised in fits into the wider picture. I think that in that area we can do something serious. Uh, the digital revolution was uh, mentioned and then of course there was also a revolution preceding the digital revolution, the revolution of paper, of verse. And I hope that you didn't have this book because you have read so much, but so this is the bookshop of the world about the seventh century in the Netherlands where well, not printing was invented, but it was really the help of knowledge crossing all these disciplines because a lot of books were published from thank here in Amsterdam. And thank you for giving me the English one rather than the Dutch one. <laughs> 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 yeah, I nearly bought it. I'm so glad that I, um, I hesitated for a moment. Also, you mentioned uh, uh, intellectual sociability. I think it's not time for intellectual sociability. Uh, we can go to without any delay because we want to clean this uh, building.